So yes, as, uh, as John said, we, um, those of you who've come along to hear the presentation on data will be disappointed because we've repurposed the whole thing in the last 24 hours to focus on coronavirus, which some of you may have heard quite enough of already. Um, I'm happy at the end to take questions on, on data or indeed anything um, if this topic uh, doesn't excite you when we, as we go through the, the update. Okay, so just, we are, um, I think, not just facing a little bit more demand for a little bit more digital uh, support as a result of, of coronavirus. The thing that's, that strikes me, uh, you know, in looking back on the last few weeks, which have been extraordinarily busy, is that what we're facing really is a fundamentally new and different demand profile uh, that we are working intensely hard to adapt to at the moment. So we are seeing an unprecedented level of citizen interaction with digital health channels, uh, which is a very good thing, that's what we, what we want. Uh, but in this particular case, of course, uh, the digital channel uh, ev evades the need for the physical contact, and that's absolutely critical. Uh, we're seeing demand to support completely new ways of working. So it is quite clear that we will have situations where we have patients self-isolating at home, we have clinicians who are working from different places, uh, not in front of the clinician, we have uh, in front of the patient. We will have clinicians who are uh, asked to care for people who are in different practices, um, for whom they may need to access uh, new records and patients they're not familiar with. So uh, a lot of the protocols and the processes we have in place around the existing systems need to adapt fairly radically as opposed to be uh, tweaked a little bit. We are continually evolving um, the, the, the clinical protocols uh, that support our urgent emergency care systems, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. But obviously, as this um, uh, epidemic progresses, uh, the clinical response protocols are being adapted very quickly, uh, and the guidance we are giving out to people is being evolved very quickly, and we're having to reflect that uh, very quickly in, in our systems. We're in a slightly new world now that we're not just adapting our own systems because, of course, uh, digital primary care is now provided across a, a number of different market providers, not just by NHS Digital. So making changes and evolving things very fast doesn't just require us to change our own systems. It requires us to work with, with the providers because we've got GP at hand and, uh, and other providers out there. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. I mean, the vast majority of them have been absolute rock stars and have worked incredibly hard with us in the last few weeks. We've had one or two interesting experiences and people sending us large bills, but they've got the joke now. Uh, and we're starting to have a slightly better uh, and collaborative response. I think, as you'd expect, different providers are able to adapt at different speeds, and we're learning a lot about their capability. Uh, but what I would say now is it's not uh, in any way about lack of effort or lack of will. We've now got uh, a really strong community effort going on. Uh, we have to think really hard about uh, how changes in protocols and changes in pathways affect resource utilization across the system in a quite a holistic way. Because one of the dangers of routing things or changing protocols is that you can reduce impact or demand in one area and it just pops up in another. It's the, it's the whack-a-mole problem. Um, and you know, it, out, outside of a crisis environment, uh, we know that when we're developing and building digital systems, one of the things that in a sense can be hardest to get right is really thinking and understanding about the, the front to back service that is being provided and not simply building digital components that when put together create a an unpleasant experience. Uh, and nothing is different actually in a crisis. You still have to have very good, holistic, whole system thinking going on. You just have to do it fast. Uh, and that's sort of pushing people hard to really think about overarching system demand aspects. Uh, we're also facing uh, rather unpredictable demand. Uh, we will you know, as the, as the crisis evolves, we'll get better and better at predicting the demand, but in, in, in the near term, it's been quite tricky. Um, uh, as an example, we did, uh, the teams did a whole bunch of load testing uh, on some of the 111 systems on Friday last week. Uh, ben called me in the evening to talk through the results, and we could see from looking at the data that the system could very comfortably handle 12 times 
the peak traffic we've ever seen before uh, uh, in the history of the, the system. So I went to bed thinking that's fairly comforting. Uh, on Monday at 6 p.m., the BBC News mentioned NHS Online, 111 Online, and within a few minutes, we saw the peak shift to 19 times, the highest we've ever seen before. So uh, we have to have a constant eye on uh, you know, wh where communications are likely to peak demand in the systems. I think paradoxically, as people become more and more familiar with the 111 online channel as well as the 111 phone channel, uh, we will see less peaks. I think we'll see a gradual uh, uptick in utilization, but I think we'll see less of these excitable moments when people suddenly discover uh, NHS online, 111 online. Uh, so demand should hopefully become easier to manage as time goes on. Uh, but it's certainly slightly tricky at the moment. Um, but I do believe, my little quote at the bottom, uh, in all these crises, in every technology crisis I've uh, ever been involved in, uh, there is always opportunity. There are always things you can do uh, in the moment that drive things the right way. Uh, and you know what we are seeing, as I said at the beginning, is more and more citizens moving to digital channels to access healthcare. That's great. That is what we need long term. That takes demand off the physical services. Uh, we also know that, that, that it drives people's behavior. If they can see their records because they're on interacting with the app or they're interacting digitally with the health system, they behave differently. They have a better interest and a better sense of responsibility for their own health care. So pushing people onto digital channels is a good thing. If this is an accelerator, then that's great. Uh, the other thing you always see if you've been managing uh, big technology organizations for decades and decades like me is that at moments like this, your organization suddenly finds new ways to push boundaries they thought existed. Because uh, what happens when you're in a difficult situation is that people question their previous assumption. Uh, they're confident because they have to be. They are, they are more creative than they have been because they have to be. Um, they're bolder, they're more decisive. Uh, and all these qualities emerge which allow you to really push what you can do with a system uh, in a way that it's quite hard to do actually uh, in sort of normal peacetime so to speak. So already we're seeing the bounds of what these uh, systems are able to do being tested in a way which is tough right now, but actually absolutely fabulous in terms of the way we drive the capability going forward. So I'm going to quickly sort of list out some of the stuff we've been worried about and then talk about a couple of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, so one of the big areas of work has been updating the relevant clinical algorithms in our pathway system, and I'll talk about, about, about that in detail in a second. And you can imagine week on week, or well, day on day, the, the demand changes, and we have to adapt those algorithms. Uh, we're, we're working hard to enable as many people as possible to access the 111 triage processes uh, digitally. So that means either via 111 online, via the website, or via the 111 triage capability within the NHS app. Uh, it is imperative, as the call centers are under higher and higher pressure, which will inevitably continue, that we move as many people as possible onto online channels um, for that first part of the triage, which can be quite time consuming. We're working to keep, obviously, the NHS.UK updated. Uh, with all of the latest information and advice, and I would urge you to, to use that as much as you can. Uh, we're collecting a lot of data, um, as you'd imagine. The 111 online system is fantastic. It produces a huge amount of information, as do the systems underneath the 111 call center. So we already had a very rich view of what was coming in on those channels, uh, but we're getting a lot of requests for additional data, which I'll talk uh, to in a minute. We're having uh, we've got a request coming in to think about how we're going to support clinicians working from home. Working from home uh, means they've got to have uh, you know, the, the right uh, telephony channels and what have you, but it also means, as I mentioned earlier, that sometimes they have to see records that exist in places they're not familiar with because they're looking at patients they might not be familiar with. We've been asked to look at completely new functions, such as how we might manage sick notes uh, in an environment where a very large number of people are sick but need to get paid. Um, we have done a bunch of preparatory exercise to prepare for the possible deployment of the national flu pandemic system. We, uh, we're not uh, 
we're not actually deploying that system right now because actually the national pandemic food system is really there. It has many parts to it, a clinician portal and a, and a citizen portal and very other, other bits, but it was really set up to allow people to access drugs quickly from many different dispensing points. And obviously in this particular scenario, there are no drugs to access. So, um, but we're, we practiced its deployment because it may become useful or it may become useful in an adapted way. Uh, it, may, it may be possible to use that service for, for, for testing or for deployment or something else. Uh, we're doing a lot of work to support information dissemination and education, as are all the ALBs, um, the webinars and um, you know, letters and all sorts of other uh, channels. And obviously, we're working hard to ensure our own readiness. And I'll just talk about that very briefly at the end. I mean, I imagine everybody's doing the same. But I think in some cases, it's useful to just share a quick tick list of things we're doing, compare them with each other. So a quick reminder of what NHS Pathways is, for those of you who are not familiar with it. So it is the, the clinical algorithm system that supports urgent and emergency care. It's a whole series of algorithms that seek to identify ask a whole bunch of questions and provide a whole bunch of advice, not to provide a full diagnosis for a patient, but to uh, come to a clear conclusion as to how that patient should be directed, what onward services they should be pointed to, whether they should be sent to the ED or booked into their GP or sent to the pharmacy or connected to a emergency dentist or, or what have you. It is the algorithm system that is used now in every single 111 service. So it's, it's the underpinning algorithm set for 111 online. It's used in, in the 111 online triage in the app. It's used in all the software systems that are used in the 111 call centers. Uh, and it's also used in now, I think, a bit more than 50% of the 999 call centers. Um, it is not used by the private providers uh, of GP software systems. They provide their own clinical algorithms which are not visible to the NHS. Um, it links directly to directories of service, so once you go through a pathway and you're able to determine that this individual needs to be directed to an emergency dentist or needs to go to the ED immediately, then you can link it directly. You can find out services available in their area at the particular time of their need. Uh, and the whole purpose of this, obviously, is to give people the care they need, but to keep them away from the critical, overloaded, central, urgent and emergency facilities where that's, uh, where that's appropriate. Um, it feeds, as I said earlier, a huge amount of daily SITREP reporting, so there's an awful lot of information we can pick up from this, uh, not just from the eventual dispositions that are, are detected in the system, but also as people use the online system, you know, as you all know, you can pick up an awful lot about uh, what's going on from people's journey through the, the digital pathways. And it's important to emphasize that it has extremely rigorous change control on it. These algorithms are very hard to get right because you're trying to cater for uh, obviously a huge population. Um, uh, yeah, potentially 55 million people with different conditions, but within that, a large number of people who have very rare conditions, but you're trying to optimize a set of questions that don't mean you ask every single person a vast number of questions to detect all possible rare illnesses, but at the same time, where possible, you don't miss things. So the optimization of the algorithms in itself uh, to balance the, 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 the operational uh, uh, real, realism of the process versus catching rare conditions is really quite tricky. The algorithms are designed in-house by our clinicians and then they are reviewed by a completely independent external group called the Independent National Clinical Governance Group. And they reach out to different colleges to use different specialists in different areas, the pediatricians or the obstetricians or whoever it is we need. Uh, so when, when changes then go into the clinical pathway, they are very, very, They've been very rigorously reviewed and approved. Um, and we now publish details of the changes to the pathways quarterly on our website, so it's quite a transparent process uh, and you know, quite safe, as safe as we can possibly make it. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty pretty heavy load as a system, as you can imagine, because it's underpinning so many of these functions. So it's about 50 calls per day that come into the 111 call center, 50K calls a day, about 300,000 journeys a month on the online system, but that is moving extremely quickly. Um, 
And over the course of the last year, there were about overall about 17 million triages that were handled through these pathways. So they're pretty well used, well tested. We review them very regularly with clinicians, partly by just looking at, uh, at data on reviewing segments of them on a periodic uh, cycle. We also review them in response to any issues that arise, uh, or obviously to specific requests that we might get from NHSE or PHE. The specific challenge we've had for COVID-19, uh, so very rapid changes. I mean, as you know, as this uh, epidemic has progressed, the clinical response has evolved quite significantly in the guidance people are being given and the way in which they're being handled by the system. Uh, so those call scripts and those clinical pathways are evolving it, most of the time daily. Um, occasionally we get a sort of 24 hour break, um, but uh, very, very quickly. Uh, you know, in what was a good test for us, I think, we proved that we were very responsive on this and getting the very first workaround that we were asked to put in into the system and deployed within five hours. Um, the the, the COVID-19 protocol now, if you go on to 111, I wouldn't encourage all of you to go on just for fun, but <laughs> if you go on, the, uh, the there's a three-phase protocol, so what we try to understand is people's travel history, people's contact history, and their symptoms. Uh, and when we put those things together, that allows for a, for a kind of risk assessment. Um, uh, it obviously you know, does what this, the, the system always does, so it directs patients in terms of how they should behave. So in this case, obviously, there's a lot of information about self-isolation um, uh, and, 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 and not wandering into GP surgeries. Uh, it also arranges clinical callbacks. Uh, and, it, and now in the directory service, we've integrated capabilities so that, so that the call handlers can identify where we've got these pods, these isolation units that are available, uh, where it is critical to move people into those care areas. There's lots of associated guidance that goes along with the pathway system because we have hundreds of thousands of call handlers and they need to have very clear information about how to manage the system and how to respond to calls. So the guidance, the advice textbook, if you like, gets updated frequently, so we're on the 15th new version since the COVID outbreak, and that will just continue to be updated and reissued with appropriate training programs, uh, helplines, et cetera, et cetera. So, as I've mentioned earlier, we're very keen now to try, start to try to move people away from calling 111 and get them to also use 111 online. Um, uh, this there's a, a special COVID-19 pathway in 111 H online now, so as soon as you go to the 111 online browser or to the app, the very front screen, uh, there's a big yellow flash and it asks you whether you're coming in because you are in some way concerned about COVID-19 and if you are, it routes you down a completely different uh, pathway. Uh, so that COVID-19 pathway has been in place since the 26th of Feb. Uh, we've seen incredibly rapid uptake, and as I say, the, uh, the way in which this gets communicated in the, in the news more broadly creates sudden blips of demand as well. Um, uh, I think we'll, what we will now see inevitably over the coming weeks, um, uh, until potentially it reaches some sort of stable phase, is that the system will have to just continually evolve, continually evolve to new clinical pathways, but we also want uh, to adapt to the way the system is choosing to handle uh, this epidemic. Uh, so that the, the digital pathways drive people's behavior in exactly the way we want, and that will mean changes to the, the, the digital customer experience and the journeys at the front end, as well as the clinical pathways. So lots of work, the teams are working extraordinarily hard um, you know, we're working out how to best manage resources for all of us is going to be a challenge for the coming months. Um, uh, but uh, I think, as I say, absolutely critical that we start to reduce the load on call centers by pulling people onto digital channels, and this is our chance to do that. Uh, this is the NHS app. It, is, it just provides a wrapper on the 111 online system. Uh, it's the same back end, it's the same load problems, exactly the same algorithms, exactly the same triage process because it is the same system, the same infrastructure. Uh, but what we know, of course, is that smartphone users, younger generation in particular, are much more comfortable with the app format 
So they will be more comfortable probably downloading the app and using that uh, as their 111 triage rather than going on to 111 online. It is, as I say, exactly the same thing. One important point to make, because it's clear from communications that people haven't fully understood it before, if you want to use the app for the sort of patient-specific functions, so if you want to uh, uh, access your GP records and test results and book appointments and make data elections and all the other great things you can do with the app, then you have to get yourself an NHS login. And there are lots of sessions going on today about NHS login and how it works. And that's a fairly heavy authentication process, as you would expect. Um, but you do not need an NHS login, and you do not need to sign in to use the 111 features. You can download the app, and you can immediately run through the standard 111 triage protocols, or now through the special COVID-19 111 protocols uh, without any login. Um, and that's important that we kind of explain that to people. Uh, it's, these are just little pictures that show you what, what it looks like. So it's embedded in all the core functions of the app. So for example, if you go and try and make an appointment with your GP, as you can see, it says, don't do that. Um, and it stops you uh, if you've got any kind of coronavirus uh, link. Uh, and then it goes through all of the standard triage processes. It tries to work out where you've been. Um, we put a little picture in so people knew where northern Italy was versus southern Italy and all sorts of other wonderfully useful features. So uh, it starts to pick up a lot of information, just as, uh, as is the case on other channels. Uh, we're getting a lot of demand for data, you know, completely normal. I mean, it's uh, always a fairly heavy period in winter for uh, data reports and information into the center because NHSC and PHE obviously uh, need to understand the profile of utilization of the s services uh, in order to optimize uh, their policies. We have done a, a lot of work pulling together information on system preparedness. Uh, again, this was all done, I mean, it was set up at our end within about uh, 48 hours, and then within about five days, we got data back, and we were able to compile all of the information. So we now have really quite rich information flow of readiness, uh, uh, you know, lots of uh, ostensibly boring things like uh, availability of kits and gloves and masks and all that good stuff, but also information about where we've got pods uh, and lots of other uh, important preparedness data. As I said earlier, the 111 system is feeding data directly up to BHE and NHSE every day to tell them what's going on on the wire. Uh, and where we've had to collect new data, I mean, we're very careful always with the legal bases for data collection. Uh, most of the data we're being asked to collect, we can collect within the uh, standard legal bases that we're then, uh, legal provisions that we already have. In some cases, we lean on the Civil Contingencies Act to allow us to uh, pull new or different sets of data. Okay, so just one... Uh, Final slide is that I thought I would just mention what we're doing internally because it's probably useful to compare with others. Uh, I like this quote, I have to say. I mean, I've, uh, in my uh, career, I've had the uh, misfortune and fortune, I think, of being involved in some fairly major incidents, including 9-11, uh, where I had a big IT team in World Trade Center. Um, uh, so, you know, w what I have learned is that this is very much the case. Whatever you plan for, something else will happen. Uh, but the very fact that you've planned uh, and you've thought about data availability and you've rehearsed your teams and you have clean protocols on how things are set up uh, enables you to adapt to whatever it is uh, that has just happened. Uh, we did a lot of work in the last year on disaster recovery and business continuity responses. We practiced for failure of all sorts of bits of the national infrastructure. That was all in response to Brexit. Who knew Brexit would be useful? Turns out it was. Uh, so we've done an awful lot of uh, rehearsing, uh, and uh, we are very ready to stand up uh, if we do see uh, issues and pressures on, on systems ac across, across the service. We're preparing for extensive remote working for our staff, so we want to make sure we've got the remote uh, access connectivity and the device access for staff that would allow 50% of them to be at home if that's necessary. Uh, but also to work functionally in teams, not to be isolated at home uh, with just a phone line, but because so much of our digital work is so dependent on, on team activity, uh, we're focusing very hard on making sure we've got the tooling for that as well. Uh, we've got an emergency line for staff that's set up. 
um, with all the usual update channels, social media. We've set up a dedicated HR helpline because we recognize people may have all sorts of different concerns uh, in this particular scenario around you know, what, what, what's permissible and what the right behaviors are and will, wh whether they'll get paid and all sorts of other things. So we've set up a separate helpline to deal with that. And internally, we've got quite a rich portal now to, to, to educate people about uh, uh, about the epidemic, but about all the different responses and our systems uh, that are supporting it. So that is my snapshot update. I'm, I hope that was what you wanted, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, on that or, or the boring old topic of data or anything else. First of all, can I ask you to put your hands together for what I think was a great presentation. Bang up today. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I want to get to as many questions as possible. Keep them short, introduce yourself. Um, lady here and then over here. And I know Sarah has to get away on a ferry. Soon, soon, okay. Hi, uh, Priya, I'm one of the service provider. Thank you for the presentation. I'm sure it gives confidence to all of us that we are ready. Um, looking at your presentation, two words, digital and COVID-19, actually reiterated that the world is connected for all the right reasons and the wrong reasons. Um, my question to you is, yes, we are ready internally today to handle this situation, but looking at the future and epidemics like this, reiterate the fact that data has, is being very important for our future, not just within the country, but to sh be able to share that data with other countries in order to fight this together and enable that you know, research. Uh, how ready we are in order to have that data in the shape and form which is easily understood by other organizations outside our countries, and we can make still, you know, sense of it. Great. I'm just going to cut you short. Um, sharing with other countries, um, yeah. Sarah. So, look, I mean, we're increasingly moving to international standards for data representations, like SNOMED, CT, and others, which does make international data sharing right. The act of sharing is a sort of policy decision, effectively, uh, and um, NHS X handle policy and strategy. So. Uh, and PHE, it, this is a fundamentally a public health decision, I guess. Um, so we would be guided by them as to whether that was appropriate and that was what they wanted, but I'm pretty convinced we could, uh, we could stretch to that and that the data is high quality and you know, in representations that a lot of people would be able to understand. Thank you. Um, there was a question over here. Hi, I'm Claire Lumby from Gloucester's ECG. The summary care record with additional information it's the only way we're going to share across NHS services this COVID-19 status of, our, of people, patients in England and provide valuable information to NHS 111 when all these calls are being made. The consent model is preventing that happening at the moment because we need explicit consent to create these records. I'm asking, is there any plans to urgently review the consent model around SCRAI so that we can manage COVID-19? So any plans to change the consent? So we are looking at uh, the load-bearing capacity of summary care record and how we can authenticate people onto it quickly if we end up scaling um, resources. The, I don't have an answer for you on the consent. It's clearly an issue that we need to find a solution to. Uh, sometimes these crises help you find slightly faster policy answers than might otherwise be the case. So let's hope. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Gentlemen here, just to give the mic runners a challenge. Eh? <laughs> Hi, Eamon Costello from Patient Empower. What about the plans for remote monitoring of symptoms um, and vitals in the event that isolation facilities are, are overcrowded? Uh, so we haven't yet been asked to look at that. I mean, I think that uh, inevitably, you know, more and more of these very new requests will come in. It's a bit like the sick note problem. Um, but, I, you know, I, I agree. I mean, we, we're, we're reasonably likely to have patients self-caring at home and their ability to feed in slightly more, uh, slightly richer data about their temperature or blood pressure or whatever uh, may well come up. So, not, not on the list at the moment. And I'm going to use a chair's prerogative, Sarah. Um, How has it felt being at the centre of all? Um, you, you've sort of spoken about you've been through some big disasters previously, yeah? but this one has got some particular characteristics to it. Yes, it's got some particular characteristics. I mean, they, they are, you know, it's very intense 
period of work. So, I mean, I would just take the time to say to the NHS digital teams, particularly in the products I've talked about, uh, they're working unbelievably hard at the moment. Um, uh, it is, you know, if you stay in Skipton House until 10 p.m., you can wander around the fourth floor and find armies of people still working. Uh, There's a huge commitment. I mean, it's such a great... Um, I just, it, it, for someone who has come into the NHS relatively recently, uh, I have to say, the, the, the general spirit and the willingness of people to, to contribute is just extraordinary. We've had people on weekends for weeks, uh, and um, you know, no complaints at all. So it's intense, but uh, it's driving you know, something absolutely critical by way of delivery, and it's creating you know, more and more capability within our, within our digital services. So I think, I think people are pretty pumped by it. Um, they could just do with a little bit more sleep. Okay. Um